This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, and to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Sarah Crew, or What Happened at Miss Minchin's, by Frances Hodgson Burnett. Part 3 that very afternoon Sarah had an opportunity of proving to herself whether she was really a princess or not. It was a dreadful afternoon. For several days it had rained continuously. The streets were chilly and sloppy. There was mud everywhere, sticky London mud, and over everything a pall of fog and drizzle. Of course there were several long and tiresome errands to be done, there always were on days like this, and Sarah was sent out again and again until her shabby clothes were damp through. The absurd old feathers on her forlorn hat were more bedraggled and absurd than ever, and her downtrodden shoes were so wet they could not hold any more water. Added to this, she had been deprived of her dinner because Miss Minchin wished to punish her. She was hungry. She was so cold and hungry and tired that her little face had a pinched look, and now and then some kind-hearted person passing her in the crowded street glanced at her with sympathy. But she did not know that. She hurried on, trying to comfort herself in that queer way of hers by pretending and supposing. But really this time it was harder than she had ever found it. Once or twice she thought it almost made her more cold and hungry instead of less so. But she persevered obstinately. Suppose I had dry clothes on, she thought. Suppose I had good shoes and a long thick coat and merino stockings and a whole umbrella. And suppose, suppose, just when I was near a baker's where they sold hot buns, I should find sixpence, which belonged to nobody. Suppose if I did, I should go into the shop and buy six of the hottest buns and should eat them all without stopping. Some very odd things happen in this world sometimes. It certainly was an odd thing which happened to Sarah. She had to cross the street just as she was saying this to herself. The mud was dreadful. She almost had to wade. She picked her way as carefully as she could, but she could not save herself much, only, in picking her way she had to look down at her feet and the mud, and in looking down, just as she reached the pavement, she saw something shining in the gutter. A piece of silver, a tiny piece, trodden upon by many feet, but still with spirit enough to shine a little. Not quite a sixpence, but the next thing to it, a four-penny piece. In one second it was in her cold little red and blue hand. Oh, she gasped, it is true. And then, if you will believe me, she looked straight before her at the shop directly facing her. And it was a baker's. And a cheerful, stout, motherly woman, with rosy cheeks, was just putting into the window a tray of delicious hot buns, large, plump, shiny buns with currants in them. It almost made Sarah feel faint for a few seconds. The shock and the sight of the buns and the delightful odors of warm bread floating up through the baker's cellar window. She knew that she need not hesitate to use the little piece of money, it had evidently been lying in the mud for some time, and its owner was completely lost in the streams of passing people who crowded and jostled each other all through the day. But I'll go and ask the baker woman if she has lost a piece of money, she said to herself, rather faintly. So she crossed the pavement and put her wet foot on the step of the shop, and as she did so, she saw something which made her stop. It was a little figure, more forlorn than her own, a little figure 
which was not much more than a bundle of rags, from which small, bare, red and muddy feet peeped out, only because the rags with which the wearer was trying to cover them were not long enough. Above the rags appeared a shock head of tangled hair and a dirty face with big, hollow, hungry eyes. Sarah knew they were hungry eyes the moment she saw them, and she felt a sudden sympathy. This, she said to herself with a little sigh, is one of the populace, and she is hungrier than I am. The child, this one of the populace, stared up at Sarah and shuffled herself aside a little, so as to give her more room. She was used to being made to give room to everybody. She knew that if a policeman chanced to see her, he would tell her to move on. Sarah clutched her little fourpenny piece and hesitated a few seconds. Then she spoke to her. "'Are you hungry?' she asked. The child shuffled herself in her rags a little more. "'Ain't I just?' she said in a hoarse voice. "'Just ain't I?' "'Haven't you had any dinner?' said Sarah. "'No dinner,' more hoarsely still, and with more shuffling. "'Nor yet nor breakfast, nor yet no supper, nor nothing.' "'Since when?' asked Sarah. "'Don't know. Never got nothing today, nowhere. I've axed and axed.' Just to look at her made Sarah more hungry and faint. But those queer little thoughts were at work in her brain, and she was talking to herself though she was sick at heart. "'If I'm a princess,' she was saying, if I'm a princess, when they were poor and driven from their thrones, they always shared with the populace. If they met one poorer and hungrier, they always shared. Buns are a penny each. If it had been a sixpence, I could have eaten six. It won't be enough for either of us, but it will be better than nothing. "'Wait a minute,' she said to the beggar child. She went into the shop. It was warm and smelled delightfully. The woman was just going to put more hot buns in the window. "'If you please,' said Sarah, "'have you lost fourpence? A silver fourpence?' And she held the forlorn little piece of money out to her. The woman looked at it and at her at her intense little face and draggled, once fine clothes. "'Bless us, no,' she answered. "'Did you find it?' "'In the gutter,' said Sarah. "'Keep it, then,' said the woman. "'It may have been there a week, and goodness knows who lost it. You could never find out.' "'I know that,' said Sarah. "'But I thought I'd ask you.' "'Not many would.' said the woman, looking puzzled and interested and good-natured all at once. "'Did you want to buy something?' she added, as she saw Sarah glance toward the buns. Four buns, if you please,' said Sarah, "'those at a penny each.' The woman went to the window and put some in a paper bag. Sarah noticed that she put in six. "'I said four, if you please,' she explained." I only have the fourpence. I'll throw in two for make-weight, said the woman, with her good-natured look. I dare say you can eat them sometime. Aren't you hungry? A mist rose before Sarah's eyes. Yes, she answered. I am very hungry, and I am much obliged to you for your kindness. And, she was going to add, there is a child outside who is hungrier than I am. But just at that moment, two or three customers came in at once, and each one seemed in a hurry, so she could only thank the woman again and go out. 
the child was still huddled up on the corner of the steps. She looked frightful in her wet and dirty rags. She was staring with a stupid look of suffering straight before her, and Sarah saw her suddenly draw the back of her roughened black hand across her eyes to rub away the tears which seemed to have surprised her by forcing their way from under her lids. She was muttering to herself. Sarah opened the paper bag and took out one of the hot buns, which had already warmed her cold hands a little. See, she said, putting the bun on the ragged lap. That is nice and hot. Eat it, and you will not be so hungry. The child started and stared up at her. Then she snatched up the bun and began to cram it into her mouth with great wolfish bites. Oh, my! Oh, my! Sarah heard her say hoarsely, in wild delight. Oh, my! Sarah took out three more buns and put them down. She is hungrier than I am, she said to herself. She's starving. But her hand trembled when she put down the fourth bun. I'm not starving, she said, and she put down the fifth. The little starving London savage was still snatching and devouring when she turned away. She was too ravenous to give any thanks, even if she had been taught politeness, which she had not. She was only a poor little wild animal. Goodbye, said Sarah. When she reached the other side of the street, she looked back. The child had a bun in both hands and had stopped in the middle of a bite to watch her. Sarah gave her a little nod, and the child, after another stare, a curious, longing stare, jerked her shaggy head in response and until Sarah was out of sight, she did not take another bite or even finish the one she had begun. At that moment, the baker woman glanced out of her shop window. "'Well, I never!' she exclaimed. "'If that young un hasn't given her buns to a beggar child! "'It wasn't because she didn't want them, either. "'Well, well, she looked hungry enough. "'I'd give something to know what she did it for.' She stood behind her window for a few moments and pondered. Then her curiosity got the better of her. She went to the door and spoke to the beggar child. "'Who gave you those buns?' she asked her. The child nodded her head toward Sarah's vanishing figure. "'What did she say?' inquired the woman. "'Ax me if I was hungry,' replied the hoarse voice. What did you say? Said I was just. And then she came and got buns and came out and gave them to you, did she? The child nodded. How many? Five. The woman thought it over. Left just one for herself, she said in a low voice. And she could have eaten the whole six. I saw it in her eyes. She looked after the little draggled far-away figure and felt more disturbed in her usually comfortable mind than she had felt for many a day. "'I wish she hadn't gone so quick,' she said. "'I'm blessed if she shouldn't have had a dozen.' Then she turned to the child. "'Are you hungry yet?' she asked. "'I'm always hungry,' was the answer. But taint so bad as it was. Come in here, said the woman, and she held open the shop door. The child got up and shuffled in. To be invited into a warm place full of bread seemed an incredible thing. She did not know what was going to happen. She did not care, even. Get yourself warm, said the woman, pointing to a fire in a tiny back room, and look here. When you're hard up for a bite of bread, you can come here and ask for it. I'm blessed if I won't give it to you for that young un's sake. Sarah found some comfort in her remaining bun. It was hot, and it was a great deal better than nothing. She broke off small pieces and ate them slowly to make it last longer. Suppose it was a magic bun, she said, and a bite was as much as a whole dinner. 
I should be overeating myself if I went on like this. End of Part 4